Бывайте и по бывшей Югославии. Прежде чем мы начнем работу секции о взаимодействии международной и национальной уголовной юстиции, я бы хотел по просьбе организаторов форума предоставить слово для краткого выступления итальянскому участнику форума Антонио Мора, заведующему департаментом взаимодействия с национальными международными судебными органами Министерства юстиции Италии. В прошлом Антонио Мура был прокурором и затем судьей. In the past, Antonio Mura was first a prosecutor and then a judge. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a great pleasure for me to address this audience. And I'm, I would like to refer my short speech, my short presentation, to the position of the prosecution in modern justice. Uh, I think today there is a growing awareness about an essential prerequisite to make jurisdiction really work in compliance with the principles of equal treatment and independence. And that is the independence also of prosecutors. Uh, if we look at Italianski, где я ничего не слышу. Я рели, я рели не слышу. Я рели не слышу вообще. Okay. E, se cominciamo uh, 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 dalle linee guide eh, famose che riguardano il ruolo uh, della procura, dell'accusa che le Nazioni Unite uh, hanno approvato nel 1990 a Lavana, uh, noi dovremmo parlare uh, dell'accusa indipendente. Se però noi guardiamo alle, ad alcune eh, differenti regioni del mondo vedremo dichiarazioni Uh, che riguardano uh, Stati Uniti d'America, Canada, eccetera, e soprattutto in Europa. Eh, noi potremo vedere che a, a livello del Consiglio d'Europa sono state approvate alcuni documenti molto importanti che riguardano appunto la situazione indipendente delle procure nazionali. La procura in questo periodo e in questo contesto posso eh, menzionare eh, in particolare le raccomanda la raccomandazione numero 19 eh, del eh, Consiglio europeo e poi c'è anche il cosiddetto Statuto di Roma approvato a livello del Consiglio consultivo dei procuratori d'Europa e anche in questi documenti è stata riconfermata la funzione indipendente della Procura uh, in, in quanto premessa fondamentale della giustizia. Siccome ho poco tempo per il mio intervento, uh, io uh, vorrei... Uh, Uh, rimandarvi al testo della mia uh, relazione che ho già consegnato agli organizzatori. Intanto voglio illustrare alcune delle mie idee, alcune delle mie proposte. Uh, in qualità di rappresentante uh, del sistema uh, giudiziario italiano, uh, io voglio dire che la funzione dell'accusa uh, è assolutamente indispensabile in una società democratica. Per audience and I would like to suggest that in the future even at the international level the foundation the theoretical foundations of the prosecution should be characterized by guarantees of real independence to safeguard the principles of impartiality and equality 
This ultimately means to protect justice. It is widely known that uh, with the statute establishing the International Criminal Court, the setting up of a permanent public prosecutor office was a major step towards a real and effective action to submit the matter to the jurisdiction and to ensure an actual respect for the legal principles recognized by democratic states. In some ways, the ICC, the International Criminal Court Prosecutors, real independence, has already been outlined, outlined. Looking at the statute of the ICC, we can clearly see uh, in the relationships between the prosecution with member state, as well as in the powers to initiate investigations proprio motu on the basis of information on crimes within the jurisdiction of the court. So, uh, coming to immediately to a conclusion, uh, I would like to underline that obviously I spoke of independence of prosecutors, but that independence clearly does not mean that his or her choices are not further submitted to judicial review. We need judicial review on decisions of prosecutors. But if we look to the modern concept of uh, prosecution and independent prosecution, I would like to say that if a common share of the fundamental principles of jurisdictions has already been uh, agreed uh, today on the threshold of the new millennium, a new important step can be made. I would like to say that a new important step is being registered. That is the identification at the international level of shared general principles concerning the prosecution function for the purposes of real justice. I think that this idea, this position of the prosecu pro prosecution and prosecutors can be another step forward in the interest of a new way of addressing international justice. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Mori. Once again, good afternoon. Uh, let me reintroduce myself. I'm Bakhtiyar Turmukhamedov, and it is my uh, task to uh, help the participants in the session, the speakers, and the audience to uh, spend this time in a beneficial and interesting way. This is a joint session organized by the International Legal Forum and Martin's readings on international humanitarian law. The Martin's readings are an ongoing regular conference which is held together by the regional delegation of the International Red Cross Committee, the law school of the St. Petersburg University, and the Russian Association of International Law. In this audience, uh, most of you represent uh, the Maritans' readings. Let me emphasize that a large group of people here are judges from international criminal tribunals for the former Yugoslavia and for Rwanda, and justice of the International Criminal Court. Criminal justice over many, which has been an internal matter for many years, has acquired a practical international dimension after the end of World War II and uh, establishment of two international criminal tribunals. 
However, those institutes were just separate episodes uh, until uh, 1990s when international criminal justice entered a stage of um, revival, uh, if not renaissance, which did not just change the international criminal law landscape, but also impacted on national criminal law systems, institutes, and doctrines. Based on the cooperation, interaction between international and national legal systems in the human rights area, it is well known that the jurisprudence dialogue unfortunately is not always uh, peaceful or uh, productive. Uh, it may take form of uh, preaching, as it's very often the case uh, when the European Court deals with the authorities of Russia, Germany, Austria, Italy and the UK. Or it may uh, turn into uh, cursing and rude criticism in the form of legal language uh, and in illustration is the uh, u.s supreme court's uh, response uh, to the decision made by u.n with respect to foreign nationals convicted to death uh, international justice dialogues are not as active uh, partly because for international criminal courts unless international human rights organizations the compliance of domestic legislations uh, with uh, the common denominator is not a priority. Nevertheless, they interact, they work together, and they make um, a regulatory impact on each other and lead to the harmonization of dialogue and mutual influence, which is an important task for both systems. And that is something the participants in our roundtable will cover. The composition of the participants is well balanced. Some of them are academics with a lot of past experience. Some others are practitioners with a lot of research that they've done. Uh, let me refrain from detailed description of all their achievements. Believe me, they are many, and uh, they deserve a lot of respect. Let me introduce my colleagues in the alphabetical order. Gleb Bogush, uh, who is Associate Professor of the Law School from the Moscow State University. Vladimir Vardenan, a leader of legal advisory service with the Constitutional Court of the Republic of Armenia, Professor Gennady Isakov, head of the uh, department head of the Criminal Law Department with the High School of Economics, Dr. Von Jonsson, President of the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda in the past justice of Denmark Supreme Court, Professor Sergei Knyazev, the Justice of the Constitutional Court of Russia, Professor Anita Ushatska, a justice of the appellate chamber of the International uh, Criminal Court. Uh, she's retired now. In the past, she's a justice of the Supreme Court of Latvia. Let's go like this. Let's first give the floor to the panelists. Gleb Bogush and Gennady Isakov are going to make a joint presentation. Let us begin uh, with the experience of the International Tribunal for Rwanda which is completing its work this year. Then uh, we'll have a presentation by the International Criminal Court, which is just beginning its operations. Then uh, we'll uh, listen to the Armenian experience. Armenia is a place where the Constitutional Court expressed doubts with respect to certain provisions of the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, whether they comply with the Constitution of the Republic. And uh, then, as we identify the framework for international legal dialogues where Russia is a participant, we'll hear specific proposals about how Russia's criminal and criminal procedure codes may be improved based on the um, achievements of international criminal justice. Each presenter, each panelist, including the joint presentation, has between 12 and 15 minutes, and then the panelists will have a chance to ask questions of each other. The same goes for the audience, or make comments, and then we should have enough time left for Q&A session. 
then uh, before I will have a chance to ask questions before the panelists uh, make their final remarks. Uh, and at the end, I will hold an event. Uh, to make it successful, I have to make sure that Yelena Borisenko, Deputy Minister of Justice, is here. I know she's around. And managing partner of Ivanian and Partneri Law Firm, he's here. A senior counsel of the same firm, Mr. Osolskin, he's here and a graduate student of uh, Moscow State University Law School, Grigory Vaipanov. He's also here. Last in introductory remark. I know my uh, own weakness. Sometimes I speak too fast. I do hope we don't make the interpreters' uh, life too difficult because they are professionals who make valuable contribution in the success of any international dialogue. With that, I'd like to give the floor to the President of the International uh, Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, uh, Van Johnson. Thanks, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I'm deeply honored for the opportunity to participate in this conference that brings together leading scholars and specialists in the field of international law and to address us such a distinguished panel of jurists, academics, and colleagues on international and national criminal justice. I would like to start by taking the opportunity to thank our co-host Martin's readings on international humanitarian law and St. Petersburg International Legal Forum for organizing this event. Also, a special note of thanks to my dear friend, Judge Tukmu Hamidov, for moderating this panel and for the work he has done to ensure its success. I cannot overstate the importance of events such as this one, especially when they bring together representatives from a diverse range of courts and institutions that are able to affect greater awareness and more informed decision-making when it comes to both international and national justice mechanisms. During the course of this conference, we continue to discuss how to collectively overcome one thing, challenges. No matter an individual's background, gender, socioeconomic status, ethnicity, and so on, we as human beings have all faced challenges. As hard as it might be to overcome some of these challenges, the knowledge and experience that we gain must be shared and used to further the development of man. And it must be used to foresee the challenges that we will inevitably face in the future. In 1994, and after the genocide saw the deaths of over 800,000 people, Rwanda confronted on an unimaginable challenge. How could reconciliation, or rather justice, be brought to those harmed by the genocide? At the time, it was not simple, and it still isn't. Immediately following the Rwandan genocide, only around five judges and 50 practicing lawyers survived the genocide. So with much of Rwanda's judicial and political structure left in ruin, the UN Security Council created the ICTR to assist Rwanda in bringing those accused of participating in the genocide to justice. In this regard, the ICTR's mandate was to prosecute those responsible for serious violations of humanitarian law committed in and around Rwanda during 1994. Practically all of these individuals, mostly high-ranking military and government officials, had already fled Rwanda. The challenge that the ICTR faced immediately, like all international courts, was its reliance on international cooperation to complete its mandate. There are three main ways that cooperation with national jurisdictions has impacted the ICTR, and I will discuss each in turn today. First is the assistance uh, with its core work, tracking and arrest of fugitives, investigations, and enforcement of sentences. The next interaction with national jurisdictions comes in capacity building and outreach, 
which the tribunal has considered to be a crucial part of its mandate to help bring reconciliation to the Great Lakes region. And the last, which in many ways relies on the success of the first two, relates to a referral of cases to national jurisdictions, which the ICTR has done as part of its completion strategy as mandated by the UN Security Council. I will begin by discussing the cooperation that the Tribunal has had with respect to tracking arrest investigations and enforcement of sentences. It is important to recall that the ICTR does not have the power of arrest and is dependent on other countries to obtain custody of indicted persons. In this regard, more than 22 countries have assisted in the tracking transfer and arrest of those indicted by the tribunal. With the help and в приобретении документов для переезда тех свидетелей, которые должны были путешествовать из Руанды в Рушу для того, чтобы выступать в качестве свидетелей. Взаимодействие с национальными юрисдикциями распространилось также и на послеследственные мероприятия, учитывая то, что трибунал опирается на страны члены для того, чтобы реализовывать приговоры, вынесенные апелляционные и Следственной палатой по статуту трибунала государства не обязаны принимать осужденных и их просят принимать добровольно на себя это обязательство. Таким образом, трибунал получал поддержку по приведению в жизнь приговоров из Бенина, Свазиланда, Франции, Италии, Швеции, Руанды и Сенегала. Однако мы должны помнить о том, что сотрудничество с национальными юрисдикциями не дорога с односторонним направлением движения. Трибунал также проводил активные попытки помогать национальным юрисдикциям посредством укрепления профессиональной по профессионального уровня э, знаний для того, чтобы разработать и обеспечить большую силу и жизнеспособным национальным судейским системам. Программы информирования населения работают в Руанде, которые обеспечивают информированность э, населения о работе трибунала посредством создания информационных центров по всей стране. Также ведутся программы обучения, профессиональные семинары, профессиональные программы и партнерство с э, учреждениями высшего образования. Так, например, ICTR провел э, семинары для более чем 150 юристов-адвокантов Руанды, судей и прокуроров с целью обучения их и подготовки судейских институтов к работе по таким э, делам. Все эти программы и взаимодействия не только стимулировали развитие судейской системы, но также обеспечили и более тесное сотрудничество и более активную поддержку трибунала. Было также активное взаимодействие между трибуналом и Руандой по мере того, как законодательство в Руанде анализировалось для того, чтобы помочь в работе над данными делами, о которых я скажу еще позже. Программы Outreach или программы по включению информированности профессионального сообщества не ограничились самой Руандой. The tribunal has also shared its lessons learned with other international justice mechanisms, 
including the ICC, the Special Tribunal for Lebanon, the ECOWAS Court, the African Court of Human and People's Rights, and the Caribbean Court of Justice. These important programs ensure that the legacy of the ICTR is not only its judicial decisions, but also the knowledge gained and lessons learned with respect to the operations of an international court, specifically with those trying accused of international crimes. В данных случаях, но также и передача знаний и модели, которые необходимы для успешной работы международного суда для того, чтобы обеспечивать сохранность этих моделей для будущего. The tribunal has taken the specialized knowledge it has gained and compounded it into a series of best practice manuals. Notably, the Office of the Prosecutor created best practices manuals on lessons learned from the referral of international criminal cases to national jurisdictions and a manual on the prosecution of sexual violence. The manual on referral of cases highlights the importance of complementarity and is intended to assist other international and national courts to build on the ICTR's achievement and empower national authorities to discharge their responsibility to investigate and prosecute international crimes in a manner consistent with international standards. The Manual on the Prosecution of Sexual Violence continues the ongoing dialogue between international and domestic judicial institutions about how best to close the impunity gap that exists for perpetrators of rape and other crimes of sexual and gender-based violence. The ICTR's judicial decisions, outreach, and capacity-building programs, along with the best practices manuals, are all illustrations of the importance that the tribunal places on engaging with and assisting domestic legal institutions so as to strengthen existing judiciaries. These programs and the sharing of lessons learned with future courts, both international and domestic, are paramount to the continued com compatibility and interaction between international and domestic actors. And now I turn to my final example of how international and national justice mechanisms interact, the referral of cases from international to domestic justice institutions, where cooperation must occur in both directions, combining aspects of the first two examples I've given today. In 2007, the Rwandan National Assembly passed what is generally referred to as the transfer law which allowed Rwandan courts to receive cases referred from the ICTR. However, between 2007 and 2008, the ICTR denied each of the prosecutor's initial requests for referral of cases to Rwanda. In each case, the trial chamber and appeals chamber identified a number of factors for these denials, which included the penalty structure, concerns over fair trial rights, judicial impartiality, and conditions of detention in Rwanda. Shortly thereafter, the Office of the Prosecutor began working with Rwanda to overcome the barriers cited by the trial chamber, and these comments became a roadmap for what needed to be done to, to strengthen Rwanda's capacity to provide a fair trial in any referred case. On 28 June 2011, the trial chamber granted the first referral case to Rwanda, noting its reasoning included the improvement to the Rwandan legal and penitentiary system and the fact that the ITR, ICTR had amended its Rule 11 bis, allowing the trial chamber to monitor referred cases along with the prosecutor who had the sole power under the original iteration of Rule 11 bis. The monitoring now falls under the mechanism for international criminal tribunals, which will handle the residual functions of the ICTR and ICTY. To date, the tribunal has referred eight cases to Rwanda, which includes six fugitive indictees and two other indictees already in custody. 
Similarly, success of the referral program was also seen in France when it apprehended two ICTR fugitives. After expressing its willingness to accept the referral of these indictments, and after the chambers determined that the accused could receive a fair trial before the French courts, the cases were referred and continue to be monitored by both the prosecution and the chambers of the Mechanism for International Criminal Tribunals. However, there were also examples of willing countries which were prevented from receiving referred cases from the ICTR. In 2006, the prosecutor attempted to refer the Bacaracasa indictment, which included genocide, to Norway. But Norway's domestic law did not at the time include the crime of genocide, and the referral chamber rejected the application. This is the principle of nulla crimen sine lege, which precludes the exercise of jurisdiction over international crimes that were not incorporated into domestic law at the time of commission or prosecution. While initially succeeding in, it, in its second attempt to refer the Bacaracasa indictment to the Netherlands, the prosecutor ultimately had to revoke the referral because one, the Netherlands lacked jurisdiction over the crime of genocide for acts committed in Rwanda in 1994, and two, because it was unlikely that the Dutch court could satisfy the nexus required under domestic law for the exercise of universal jurisdiction, which meant the physical presence of the accused in the Netherlands when the case started. The success and limitations of the ICTR's referral program demonstrates both the interaction and the compatibility, or as it is often the case, the incompatibility between international and national jurisdictions from a judicial perspective. How these incompatibilities have been resolved is an important lesson in facing challenges and continuing to work to overcome them. The great philosoph philosopher Aristotle once said, quote, at his best man is the noblest of all animals. Separated from law and justice, he is the worst, end quote. As the political and judicial mechanisms of the world develop and change, it is our duty to continue the fight against impunity and continue to part participate in discussions like this one about the evolution of our own legal systems. I once again would like to extend my gratitude to the organizers for providing me with the opportunity to speak with you today. I would also like to thank this esteemed panel uh, and I look forward to the discussions to come. Thank you. Спасибо, судья Йонсон. Я не решался прерывать Волна, потому что он был все-таки председательствующим судьей в самом первом моем деле в трибунале по Руанде. Слово предоставляется судье международной апелляционной палаты Международного уголовного суда в отставке профессору Аните Ушацко. On the 18th of May, quite recently, I left The Hague, the legal capital of the world, where they have four international courts. After my 12 years of honorary service at the International Criminal Court, six years in the pre-trial investigation and six years with the appeal, uh, in a week's time, I am finding myself on the capital of the Supreme Courts of the Russian Federation, and I'm speaking to this esteemed audience. The subject of my address is the International Criminal Court, and here I would like to focus on the following. In fact, I wanted to speak in English at the beginning, but then mm, to join the discussion in Russian. However, I decided to speak entirely in Russian. In English, the subject of my talk is International Criminal Court. 
and domestication of international law. So how do we translate this domestication? I asked my colleagues about this. Perhaps domestication should be taken literally. And in fact, we have an interesting issue here, which stems uh, from the terminology accepted in different languages. As to my criminal court, in 12 years of my service, the court uh, has done a huge amount of work uh, from scratch. And in fact, we have a lot of cases still underway. Now, since this is an independent court, 122 participants, state participants um, are involved. In fact, what does this mean? This means that 122 states accept the international law standards. Based on the data provided by the Coalition of International Organization of the International Criminal Courts, today over 60 states have already harmonized their legislation in compliance with the Roman Statute and are continuing this work. Nevertheless, we ought to remember that the Security Council of the United Nations can, Nations can also turn with a case to the court and for the Security Council of the United Nations, it doesn't matter whether it's a state that's part of the Roman Statute or not. So essentially, the International Criminal Court covers the whole world. Consider what has happened in the national legal systems after the Roman Statute was passed. Well, here some very interesting data emerge, and in fact, they are not yet generalized sufficiently. However, based on the research from one American university, over these 12 years, 11 years, really, 20. Investigations on genocide have taken place in the world. 46 cases of criminal persecution on military crimes and 67 investigations on crimes against humanity. Even more so, the geography is the geographic span is actually quite interesting. It's Yugoslavia, Rwanda, Guatemala, Argentina, Iraq the Democratic Republic of Congo. This means that essentially the operations of the criminal court, the establishment of the criminal court, provided an incentive to the national states to consider these cases and investigate on them. Now, taking into account the fact that our criminal court is based on the principle of complementarity. This means to say that the um, international criminal cases are not only investigated by uh, the international judges, but also by the national judges. That is, the national judges become international judges wearing two hats at once. <coughs> Consider the court's experience over 12 years. Here is another dimension where we can see the following. Many of the states where investigation is done by the criminal court in different cases, many of those who also monitor and observe the work of the criminal court are dissatisfied with the work of the criminal court. and voice a consideration that such like criminal cases should indeed be investigated domestically. Now, this approach is based on the following perception. The court encounters major difficulties in implementing the um, resolution of the court, that the investigation is very complex and very time-taking, and besides that the court in the way it is located is actually quite distant and 
remote from the conflicting regions. So the proposal <coughs> is made whereby the national judges are more adapted to uh, considering such cases because they are based in the site of the conflict. They ought to consider the um, stance of both parties to the conflict, not only work unilaterally, because currently all the cases of the criminal court are the so-called self-referrals. This means the states have referred single-handedly to the courts and that's the state where the conflict is ongoing. So every conflict takes two parties. So if you have one party uh, referring to the court, and that's the government of the state, and that's the party on which providing the evidence uh, depends, and hence the work of our investigators, <coughs> one may end up in thinking that the court's approach is biased or unilateral. Another source of disappointed is that the International Criminal Court is pretty much limited to the cases coming from Africa rather than other regions. There's a serious reason to that, but uh, on the other hand, uh, you know, it's it's a criticism of the prosecutor, and the criti criticism is about the selective approach. So the return of international uh, right back home, or bringing international law home. <clears throat> a vertical domestication of international law is something that is extremely important. I would like to use two examples, two, two different examples to illustrate the challenges we may come across. The first example is India. Just like the United States, China or Russia, India is not a member of the Rome Statute. And uh, some time back, <clears throat> there was a Ujaras uh, pogrom clash religious and ethnical clash back in 2002 and that resulted in a violence act that was passed in India. The violence act borrowed many of its provisions from the Rome Statute. In other words, a government which is not a member of the Rome Statute borrows provisions from the document they never signed, borrowed provisions of international law, and that's an excellent way uh, which may be used even for non-member states. It's a way to use. It's an experience to use. Another example comes from Bangladesh. Bangladesh is a signatory to the Rome Statute. Uh, they have been a member since uh, the very early stage of ratification. In 1971, uh, during the Civil War, genocide was committed, acts of genocide were committed in Bangladesh. Like I said, it was back in 1971. Later, 40 years later, in 2009, a special act was adopted, the International Crime Act was adopted, and a special tribunal for international crimes was created. The special tribunal for international crimes started hearing cases. At first, they arrested the suspects without uh, any formal indictments. So from the very beginning, their rights, human rights, were violated, uh, and uh, as, as well as the right to defense, which was also grossly violated. One trial ended in a life sentence imposed on one defendant, and uh, that uh, created uh, a lot of dissent among local population, and then they adopted a death penalty 
Act, which was used retroactively uh, with respect to the person who was convicted for the same crime. That example shows uh, how uh, a nation, how a country which is a member of the Rome Statute may apply international law provisions erroneously in violation of international law. So that leads us to an interesting question. A human rights activists in Bangladesh, they come to, to, to court and they ask uh, questions uh, about how come the court does nothing uh, when such gross violations of human rights are committed. And of course, if you look at the Rome Statute, you'll never find a single provision which gives the International Criminal Court the right to oversee situations in different jurisdictions. Uh, those jurisdictions are quite sovereign, but still we have been hearing more and more voices saying that the association of uh, member states should think and create a body <coughs> or institution which could uh, disseminate the experience of international criminal law, educate uh, national judges, educate them to the recent research. And you know that they have this Venetian Commission in Europe and what they uh, do, they uh, monitor constitutional legislation. So this new institution could, could share their expertise with respect of the legislation adopted by um, individual jurisdictions. Uh, I, I love this. Um, word combination invisible college uh, of international lawyers uh, uh, i love this saying uh, and such a college should exist in every country and of course it should exist in russia in a country of huge legal potential so that uh, such colleges could participate in implementing and enforcing, incorporating international criminal law into national legal systems. Of course, uh, we don't want to simplify this exceedingly complicated issue because the Rome Statute is built into different systems of law. Uh, Anglo-Saxon and uh, continental law, common law and continental law, and sometimes it, it leads to some absurd results. Let me give you a recent example. I have uh, read that Georgia has adopted a new criminal procedure code, and the current body of laws is based on the system of Anglo-American law. As they apply the code uh, in real life, uh, they had this criminal case where the defense uh, filed a motion to summon to court 4,000 witnesses and have them uh, examined in court. And of course, uh, from the point of view of um, you know speedy trial, it doesn't make any sense, but the judge blessed it. So we, you want to have a balance, and, and you want to have an institution which could operate under the criminal code or on its own, the institution which could help different jurisdictions domesticate international criminal law. Thank you very much. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Adita. Uh, you may transliterate the word domestication into Russian and then it will sound very pretty. Yes, very pretty and very English. Dr. Varganyan, please. Hello, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon, distinguished participants in the forum. Thank you very much for inviting me to come and participate in the forum at uh, this uh, final joint session. Unlike Dr. Ushotsky, I have no issue with uh, translation because my presentation doesn't have a name. 
I'm going to share with you some significant problems that might arise because of a possible ratification of the statute of the International Criminal Court. Before I speak about uh, the issues I would like to cover in my presentation, I would like to highlight one very important symbolic fact. Uh, 100 years uh, today, uh, in this very building, in the, in the building which housed the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Russian Empire, based on Sergei Sazonov, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Russian Empire, a joint declaration of Russia, France, and uh, the uh, UK was uh, developed condemning uh, genocide of Armenian uh, population in the Osman Empire. And for the first time, the uh, term crime against humanity was used. Today, on the 29th of May 2015, the text of the declaration uh, was uh, officially uh, submitted and uh, Everything that has been said puts a lot of content into our current discussion. At the same time, it makes you think about uh, how we want to improve the system of uh, international criminal justice. Maybe we should do it better and more aggressively. For over 100 years, we have been trying to create an environment where <coughs> Uh, offenses criminalized by international law um, uh, could be prosecuted by uh, the overall international system. We are not always successful in doing that. Uh, Armenia was quite emotional when uh, the statute of the International Criminal Court was created. Not just Armenia, a lot of countries felt emotional about that because the statute is a new uh, cornerstone uh, in uh, the fight against crime uh, on the level of international criminal law. And if uh, the attitude of permanent members of the Security Council had been more flexible, it uh, would um, have made it possible for a greater number of jurisdictions to participate in the statute in a more comfortable way. It has to be highlighted that the issue of um, prosecution uh, for crimes uh, punishable under international law have always um, been uh, in the center of attention uh, in Armenia, especially in the context of genocide and recently because of what is going on in the Middle East, including unprecedented cases when cultural uh, artifacts uh, are ruined and where there is a threat posed for whole groups of people. Well, seemingly uh, with the permanent uh, body of international criminal justice, Armenia should have become a permanent member. And the Armenian delegation participated actively in the development of the statute, participated in the diplomatic conference in 98, voted for the adoption of the statute of the ICC, and on the 1st of October 2009, we signed the statute. But uh, th th then the whole process was kind of suspended or halted because it became quite obvious that we have a lot of problems, constitutional and criminal law problems, which uh, make it necessary to introduce required changes. That's why we postponed ratification. It was only in July 2004 that the President of the Republic approached to the Constitutional Court and filed a motion on uh, reviewing the statute uh, for compliance with the domestic legislation. And Judge uh, Bakhtiar uh, was quite right. In 2004, the Constitutional Court of Armenia 
uh, issued a ruling finding some of the provisions of the statute uh, not in compliance with the constitution of Armenia. It has to be said that Armenia's constitution, in 2004 we had the previous version of the constitution, uh, and and, and uh, the current constitution uh, have a provision uh, on preliminary mandatory constitutional control over all international treaties to be ratified by the National Assembly. And uh, that was the reason why the President of the Republic approached the Constitutional Court in the first place. Armenia's Constitutional Court found two provisions of the statute as non-constitutional. The first provision had to do with complementarity. The Constitutional Court came to the conclusion that the national criminal justice system could not be complemented by a foreign element. And the second provision, which uh, the Constitutional Court found problematic uh, from the point of view of its compliance with the Constitution, was that uh, the Constitution of Armenia uh, guarantees uh, presidential power for pardon and uh, National Assembly's exclusive right for amnesty. Uh, so the current constitution of Armenia um, has uh, includes a right of the convict for pardon. Because of, of those discrepancies between the statute and Armenia's constitution, the statute was never ratified because of the ruling of the constitutional court so to say, uh, vetoed the further ratification of the statute. Other than that, um, the, the ruling issued by the Constitutional Court uh, was rather technical. That uh, ruling aimed uh, at further uh, changes of the Constitution on better uh, regulation of the statute and its implementation in new conditions. At that time, a lot of work was done to adopt a new version of the Constitution, and the Constitutional Court sent a signal to the drafters of the new Constitution um, that, yes, the Constitutional Court believes uh, that uh, the statute conflicted with the text, with the letter, but not the spirit of the Constitution. And, in, in, you know, in the justification part, the Constitutional Court uh, argued that the statute of the International Criminal Court can be ratified, provided there are some changes introduced, it will be introduced in the Constitution. So it was a certain message issued by the Constitutional Court, which made it clear that it did not have any, any problems with having Armenia um, a member of the ICC statute. The only prerequisite will be to change the text of the Constitution and to uh, introduce an amendment which could take care of uh, the technical conflicts, and there will be no quarrels, no problems from the point of view of the constitutional spirit. Unfortunately, the constitutional reform which resulted in the current constitution did, did not include a provision which could make the statute ratification possible and this uh, issue is still in limbo. We have discussed this issue at many conferences and workshops. Yes, the attempts uh, were made several years ago to raise the issue of uh, ratification. The prosecutor of the court, Mr. Campo, came to Armenia several years ago and brought this issue back on the agenda. But Armenia's constitution is very difficult to change. You need a national referendum to change even the smallest of its provision. Uh, provisions. So practically, it was unrealistic uh, to have a referendum for the sole purpose of uh, statute ratification. But in 2013, the re president created a constitutional reform commission. It's a highly professional commission operating under the president. It is headed up by the chief justice of the constitutional court. Uh, the commission. Uh, in 2014, uh, 
adopted a document called a Constitutional Reform Strategy. And because many international organizations, including Red Cross uh, and other non NGOs, um, have approached the Commission with lots of different proposals, the uh, strategy of the constitutional reform has it as a special, as a separate provision that the Commission uh, considers it necessary to create uh, required uh, prerequisites to ratify the ICC statute. So the, the strategy of the Commission is very clear. It, it demonstrates its goodwill, its desire to become a member of the ICC statute. Of course, it is very difficult to foresee um, which option will be chosen by the Commission because the language has not been drafted yet, but we believe that the Commission is going to follow the Franco-Luxembourg, Franco-German model and will uh, introduce an article, a new article into the Constitution, which will take care of all possible conflicts with other articles of the Constitution, which theoretically could prevent us from ratifying the statute. Uh, as for the justification uh, offered by the Constitutional Court, I can tell you that the issue of pardon and amnesty is no longer relevant because the European Court for human rights, uh, it was a case of Margot uh, versus her Croatia, said that amnesty for war criminals uh, is considered as a serious violation of the European Convention for Human Rights. As for complementarity, uh, there will be no issue about that because the Armenian judicial system is already complemented with certain international institutions, including the European Court for Human Rights. As for the changes in development on the legislative level, uh, you know, ICC statute ratification is not the end of the story, it's just the beginning of the story. You need to implement it into domestic legislation and change the domestic legislation. And here we can boast some positive progress, positive changes in the realm of criminal and criminal procedure law. Uh, Armenia has more than constitutional reform. Uh, we are developing criminal law and criminal procedure uh, law reform. We have a new draft codes, criminal code and criminal procedure code. As for the criminal code, there's no issues because at the outset, it is the drafters' goal to bring the criminal code in compliance with international law and criminalize all of the crimes which are criminalized in the statute. And the Armenian Criminal Code, the existing code, has a chapter called uh, Crimes Against uh, Peace and Security of Mankind. They criminalize some of the offenses, but not all of the offenses criminalized by the ICC statute and other international instruments. The drafters are um, uh, going to bring this part of the criminal code in complete compliance with international instruments, even though I have to admit that that part of the criminal code of Armenia, I wouldn't say that it's a stillborn baby, but it's, uh, you know, dead letter, so to say, because it has never been used in practice. As for criminal procedure, of course, un unlike Georgia, we chose not to follow the Anglo-Saxon scenario. Our scenario is that of convergence. I think that in the 21st century, in the time of globalization, it is difficult uh, to choose classical legal systems. So we should focus more on the convergence of legal systems. In that respect, the new criminal procedure code is getting rid of archaic and outdated principles. Uh, we uh, seek to be more pragmatic than classical. A decision has been made uh, to remove all international cooperation issues from the Criminal Procedure Code and write a new act which will regulate the relationship between Armenia and ICC in the future. 
In conclusion, uh, I would like to, you know, uh, put a wet blanket. In 2014, even Armenia, the Armenia did not ratify the ICC statute, but it signed and ratified a different document, an agreement with the United States on extradition. From the United States to the international judicial institutions, and in fact, this makes the situation far trickier. I believe the Republic of Armenia will have to float between the available agreements, and as a lawyer specialized in international law, I believe the priority should always be with implementation of the imperative principles of the international law. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vladimir. Sergei Knyazev, judge of the Constitutional Court of the Russian Federation. Good afternoon, dear participants of the well, forum. In fact, let me note that specifically I have never dealt with criminal justice, and particularly even more so with international criminal justice. In fact, on the one hand, this renders far more responsibility to my address to this very representative um, audience. At the same time, this somehow excuses me for saying something completely unacceptable in this highly distinguished audience. I would like to talk about the domestic uh, setup and the international standards regarding this issue. The, clearly, the adoption of the Constitution of Russia of 1993, in which Russia announced itself part of the international community and recognized the international uh, norms and standards as part and parcel of its legal system, essentially imposed the responsibility and liability on our state, whereby it committed itself to putting its uh, legal institutions into compliance with the international standards, inclu including those uh, on, international, on criminal justice. Clearly, this is a mission of great responsibility the state undertook to implement. And uh, now we ought to remember about the perception of our justice, in particular of our criminal justice. Uh, there are well-known proverbs like, you get to the court, you never find the truth. You never get out dry from the court, uh, just in the same way you never get out dry from a lake. Uh, you have to have a human being. An article is always there to sentence him. But clearly the perception of uh, criminal justice indeed in some way uh, reflected its real state, and this required some radical measures. And in this sense, the reliance on the international and, in the first place, on the European standards looked quite reasonable, as well um, as the, the counting on them. Today, if one puts his mind to it, um, it is quite easy to find quite a big number of sources of the international law where these standards are stipulated. Uh, I am referring to these soft uh, sources as well as to the norms and standards of the international law that are generally recognized as principles to enact. And I believe to a great degree the greatest importance in terms of putting the Russian uh, criminal justice into compliance with the international standards universally spread um, and accepted and reflected in the universal principles and expectations are indeed the propositions uh, that are part of the International Pact on Civil and Political Rights and uh, within the European Convention on Human Rights and Mean Freedoms. And in this sense, our goal in the first place is to target what is stipulated in the language of these international papers, while at the same time remembering how significant the interpretation is. The interpretation provided by the Committee on Human Rights, the authorities of supranational jurisdiction, as well as by the European Court on Human Rights. And yet there is another factor to bear in mind, and clearly we cannot miss out on it, whereby having recognized the international law and having prioritized it over the domestic Russian laws, uh, the Constitution reads that the supreme legal force, the direct 
action and enforcement within the territory of the Russian Federation nevertheless remain with the norms and principles stipulated in the domestic constitution. Clearly, this does not pose any specific challenges uh, in terms of reforming uh, the criminal uh, case uh, dealings and uh, clearly we have to bring into compliance these two standards, the constitution of the Russian Federation and the international stand uh, standards. There are no major contradictions between them, especially um, since uh, these two sources really reproduce and complement one another. The issue, I believe, may be rather in the interpretation and in the practical, and practical implementation of the requirements of the Constitution and the requirements of the international standards in the real setup of the Russian criminal justice. I believe to a great extent we can talk about the following. There is no such thing as a rejection or denial of the national principles of justice, which are formalized in the Constitution and in the international standards of justice, as well as the activities of the Russian courts. And in this sense, I could appeal to the decisions of the Constitutional Court, which many times in its practice um, I have considered when evaluating uh, the norms of international procedural law and in fact I've applied the local constitution and the sources of international law as well because you can uh, find this in many resolutions of the courts uh, related to the issues um, uh, such as the implementation of the home arrest or a possibility of seizing a criminal uh, case uh, due to the death of um, the accused person in case it's his close uh, family are against it. Also when it comes to the remuneration, to sorry, to the compensation of the right for um, uh, violating the standards of the case investigation in due time, so in all cases, the Constitutional Court of the Russian Federation uh, has identified that the norms of the Constitution as well as the standards um, spread on the international level, in fact, oblige the lawmaker to pursue the principles of effective, humanistic, responsible and meticulous uh, justice. The situation we have in the Russian legal system today regarding uh, the criminal uh, case uh, consideration, I, would I don't want to proceed uh, to present it as ideal. And we all understand it is not at all ideal when it comes to criminal case proceedings. Russia, in fact, is in one of the leading positions in terms of the number of the violations uh, recorded in the resolutions of the Strasbourg Court, in particular in criminal and uh, procedural sphere. Here I would mention three major challenges which are either systemic or that can become systemic. And that's noted by this court of Strasbourg in the first place. Our colleagues from the European Court on Human Rights believe that the killer's heel of the Russian criminal justice is still the problem of active use and active application when doing a criminal investigation and pre-trial investigation using the recurring to the arrests. Unfortunately, the courts still believe and consider it necessary to recur to this measure or mainly to recur to this particular measure consider that considering that this is the most efficacious one. Whereas I personally believe that the considerations shared by our colleagues from Strasbourg are definitely worth attention. That is, that the approach of the Russian courts is way too formal. It is sufficient for an authority doing uh, the additional investigation or the supplementary investigation or the pre-trial investigation to consider that the suspect may 
uh, leave the country because he is a holder of a foreign travel passport or that this person can exert some influence on the potential uh, witnesses or demolish and destroy the evidence this immediately is um, used against this uh, person and is accepted as uh, proper grounding by the courts i mean of course all these considerations should not be based on the likelihood and in the sense uh, in which the strasbourg court interprets the european convention it clearly should be uh, the way the russian criminal justice acts as well and it is an absolute must that the uh, consider all the evidence and proof that on the one hand would uh, go to uh, prove the necessity to uh, place the person under arrest and at the same time uh, should give uh, the um, authorities an opportunity to recur to softer measures. Also, uh, when criminal cases are considered a court uh, and at the pre-trial stage, we all understand that this is not a specifically legal issue because there are lots of challenges to be addressed in uh, material terms. At the same time, the overpopulation of uh, the uh, trial detention of facilities and the absence of correspondence to the sanitary requirements, which oftentimes is the case in Russia, unfortunately. All of this is not at all in line with what's stipulated by the European Convention, the Constitution. This does not agree with the respect for human dignity, and this is what does not make it possible to duly care for ensuring that even the suspects uh, detained for potential criminal uh, liability uh, should be treated as human beings. Another point we need to stress with regard to the um, case law available is that uh, the Russian criminal justice is way too tolerant uh, regarding the use of the evidence provided through such investigation as, for instance, a checkup uh, acquisition, uh, a test acquisition of uh, drugs uh, in dealing with uh, drug-related cases, or, for instance, the same practices in bribery-related cases. Our colleagues from Strasbourg believe that at times these tools are used not to identify whether or not uh, the offense has taken place, but as a truly provocative measure in order to impose the guilt on uh, the person who may not initially have been guilty of dealing with drugs. And also any law enforcement in the um, procedural uh, sphere should be reliant on uh, the Constitution and on the international standards of which uh, fundamental, I believe, are the equality before the courts and the law and the adversary nature of the uh, criminal proceedings. Not always in their practical dealings, the courts really pursuing the goals of adversarity and equality in uh, criminal case proceedings. To prove this, um, I would like to quote one of the best known patients of the Russian criminal justice system, Mikhail Khodorkovsky, who, having been through his criminal schooling, shared some impressions of the knowledge, the expertise uh, he has gained on the attitude to the Russian uh, criminal litigation uh, system uh, from uh, the prison he has been in. 
Uh, no one believes the court unless it's a uh, trial by jury, and the court never believes anyone unless it's the representatives of the uh, investigators or the uh, proponents of um, guilt in either of their capacities. So I believe this very much is in line with how the principle of the adversariety of the uh, procedures is used in uh, the Russian criminal justice. Of course, uh, there is no way to oversimplify the situation, and uh, clearly the Russian criminal justice should not be taken to be reliant only on one dimension, that is getting the parameters of the Russian criminal justice up to the standards of the international law. I mean, in my view, the Russian national legal system in the first place, thanks to the principles and norms of the Constitution, has its own resources to improve and develop A good proof to this is how today are interpreted and enforced, enforced with the reliance on the resolutions of the Constitutional Court of Russia, the norms on compensation for violating the rights for the court's investigation of a criminal case, and uh, among others, in due time, uh, in a reasonable amount of time. And if the re European courts usually tie this right to uh, suspects or people in the rest, the Russian uh, criminal uh, law trusts that this is a right to be enjoyed uh, by both the victim and the perpetrator, and those who for a long time have been trying to start a lawsuit for um, unsuccessfully and then encountered rejections and denials uh, until the time the uh, liability window for uh, criminal offense um, and of filing a lawsuit against it would expire. So I believe um, depriving of political and electoral rights of the individuals who have been uh, sentenced for a criminal offense is another uh, source of debating here, because in a well-known case Coppola against Italy, our colleagues from Strasbourg believe that the European Convention under certain conditions makes it possible to sentence uh, someone for life uh, in case of a criminal offense, and in fact uh, the electoral rights should um, not be granted to this person ever again. The Constitution of the Russian Federation implies that the deprivation of electoral rights can only take place for those individuals who are sentenced for lifetime uh, imprisonment. In all other cases, the Constitution prioritizes the protection of their rights, uh, relying on the Constitution and not on the international standards. Gleb and Gennady decide who would like to come first. Associate Professor Bogush, thank you. Dear participants, ladies and gentlemen, the mere fact of um, this round table at the International Legal Forum, the mere fact of having uh, this round table focusing on international criminal law speaks volumes. The subject, which was, if not exotic, but uh, pretty irrelevant for the Russian legal community several years ago, is um, highly topical today. Uh, in Russia, we have, if I may call it so, a demand for international criminal law. The reason is not uh, just growing international attention, military conflicts, uh, 
uh, which uh, take place not far from the Russian national border. No, there is another reason, and this other reason is a huge leap in the development of international uh, criminal law, which we have been observing over the past 20 years. Oh, there will be pretty soon uh, 20 years since the time the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia started working and international legal practice on international crimes has been mounting. At the background of the 20-year-long uh, fast development of international criminal law. The situation in Russia does not uh, seem uh, so bright. Uh, anyway, it does not instill any optimism because we are dragging behind the overall development. The first thing I'd like to describe is the uh, Russian legislation. The Russian Criminal Code, just like many other criminal um, codes in former Soviet Union, has a chapter on international crime. We have provisions which comply with the provisions of uh, the Realm Statute of ICC and other sources of international criminal law. Nevertheless, such provisions are poorly systematized with plenty of loopholes, which is um, a reason why over the past 20 years the statistics quoted by uh, Justice Ushatska shows that all uh, this huge body of cases does not include cases from Russia. Criminal statistics show that the Russian Federation is not um, had uh, successful international uh, investigations. Even though uh, Russia had a huge uh, domestic war conflict in Northern Caucasus and the international war conflict in Georgia in 2008. And we are behind uh, the international community academically as well. Russia has uh, not built uh, any significant uh, research or discussion of the issues which are relevant for international criminal law and the level of discussion, level of research does not make it possible to say that Russian uh, criminal, international criminal law research is on the international level. Still, I believe, uh, and my many colleagues who are involved uh, in creating international uh, criminal law awareness in Russia agree with me, the situation is far from being pessimistic. There is a reason for optimism, which is related to the future, to what may and should be done currently. I would speak about three different areas where we may implement international criminal law. Well, like many uh, of you have said earlier, to make international criminal law domesticated in Russia. The first area is legislation that goes without saying, and here there is a need to upgrade a lot of provisions. Uh, the underlying idea which uh, we may rely on as we improve international our, our provisions would be to translate uh, international uh, provisions into the language of the Russian legal system. Those provisions, those articles which are successfully used internationally should be incorporated in the Russian criminal code in such a way that they could be actually implemented in real life in an efficient way. That is the That was the biggest task for the working group uh, created at an international conference on international criminal law implementation. That group was supported by the Red Cross Committee. Today, my colleague Professor Yasakov is going to speak about um, the work uh, that they did at that time. Another area I would like to highlight, and that is what my colleagues from different tribunals, ad hoc tribunals, paid attention to, because my colleagues from ad hoc tribunals, they keep doing a lot in this sphere. So the second area is training. 
It is quite obvious if you look at the composition of the audience today that international criminal courts have a lot of experts from Russia, a lot of people from Russia working there, and those people deserve a lot of respect. Still, uh, the need in such experts, in lawyers um, which are familiar with international criminal law and who know how to apply the law, such experts are needed and they, they are numerous. And here, what is necessary for Russia is to have a good curricula, training, training programs. What we need, we, we need to process the experience of ICCs and domestic courts uh, which prosecute international crimes. Speaking about the European Convention for Human Rights, we may say that the, uh, there is a wonderful program operating under the convention that I'm speaking about the HELP program whose goal is to train professional lawyers uh, in the uh, application of the European Convention of Human Rights. Uh, some of the things the program does, it trains judges and prosecutors who prosecute, investigate and prosecute international crime. And uh, finally, the last, the third area I would like to describe in my very brief presentation has to do with the future, with educating students and training future generations of lawyers uh, who will uh, necessarily specialize in international criminal law. Just a month ago, the High School of Economics in Moscow, Russia, completed the fourth international competition uh, on uh, mock in international criminal law that was supported by the International Criminal Court. This year, 15 Russian universities participated in the competition. Uh, and uh, what I'd like to share with you is not my impression. I'd like to quote uh, Han Mr. Henderson, Justice of the ICC. He was the presiding judge in our mock trial at The Hague in, in the finals. And after the competition was over, Justice Henderson said, we realize uh, that uh, the issue of Russia's ratification of the Rome Statute cannot be answered in terms of whether it will happen and when it will happen. But when it happens, uh, I may tell you that Russia's future is in the good hands. Uh, I may tell you that it is the younger generation, the interest demonstrated by uh, younger lawyers and the students and still a lot of optimism. I, and uh, this optimism has to do with domesticating uh, international criminal law. No matter what decisions, specific decisions are made, this is what we should work for. Thank you very much. And because our presentation in, is joined, I'd like to give the floor to my colleague, Professor Isakov. Let me just tell you, Gennady, that you don't have more than seven minutes. Thank you very much. I, I fully recognize my responsibility vis-a-vis -vis the audience, which is tired to be passive listeners and can't wait to ask questions of the panelists. So I'll try to be reasonable with my time. With the blessing of Professor Oshaski, now we seem to have a new term, domestication of international law, and uh, let me cover some of the key issues which may arise as a result of domestication. The first thing to say, it has been mentioned by many previous panelists, in some areas. The Russian Federation, uh, well, some time ago it used to be a driving force um, behind the development of international law and international humanitarian law back in the 19th century for many reasons, political and economic reasons. Uh, Russia now, and I'm being quite pessimistic, has been pushed aside to the outskirts of the uh, international criminal law field. The sorry state of uh, the Russian legislation is a manifestation of that sad fact. Uh, there's some key 
points uh, which uh, highlight a set of problems, a set of challenges the Russian Federation faces as it tries to investigate and prosecute international crimes. Uh, let me briefly describe those key points to make it clear to you how much work we'll have to do to develop the Russian criminal law. One of such sensitive or key points uh, is bringing uh, international criminal law provisions in compliance with the classical principle of the Russian law, because there is no crime which is not criminalized, there is no offense which is not criminalized in the law. And that refers us to the whole set of international criminal law and international humanitarian law provisions where Russian law enforcement agents uh, will have to decide whether they want to apply statutes on crimes against security of mankind. They may uh, encounter a situation where an injunctive uh, article is a custom uh, under the international criminal law or international humanitarian law and is not criminalized in the Russian legislation. Let's look at this wonderful guidelines of the Red Cross Committee on the customs rules of international humanitarian law used in war conflicts creates a potential conflict between there is no offense unless it's criminalized in the law and the uh, customs nature, custom nature of uh, this rule. There are purely technical problems uh, which are related to the conflicts between the general and specific parts of the Russian code. One of such challenges which was described during the Martin's readings has to do with universal jurisdiction. Universal jurisdiction is defined in such a narrow way in Russia that it is limited to war crimes committed during military conflicts, international military conflicts, and doesn't cover genocide or crime against humanity, which is not criminalized in the Russian criminal law. The most paradoxical and vivid example is that Russia still doesn't have a provision which some researchers believe goes back to the 15th century, and they're quite positive uh, that it uh, was in the body of law in the 20th century. We still don't have the commander's um, liability codified in the supplementary protocol. In Russia, the commander can, cannot be prosecuted. We don't have a legal tool to do so. We don't have any article to do, to do so. The, the existing provisions are so rudimentary that they uh, create um, a space of impunity. And uh, that creates a lot of uh, theoretical criminal law problems um, related to objectivity and subjectivity of the elements of crime, to the concept of the target of the crime and all. That uh, means that we have to do a lot of work to domesticate international criminal law. There are more uh, problems uh, related to the special part of the criminal law. The legislature, back in 1996, managed to do what no other legislatures managed to do, except for uh, ex-Soviet countries, which followed Russia's example. In three or four lines, depending on the font, they squeezed more than 150 year long development of international criminal law. This article includes all possible and impossible war crimes. Even though the Russian law doesn't have liability for instigating genocide, we don't criminalize uh, crime against humanity and some other crimes. As for war crimes, um, well, hypothetically, it may be used under Article 356, but uh, here uh, one can ask a serious question about how constitutional this provision is. 
th this uh, provision, this article lacks lacks accuracy. It is a super er exceedingly blanket provision, very vague provision. It just says something to the effect that war crimes should be punished. The language is so vague, the language uh, lacks certainty so much that uh, it is not surprising at all that it has never been used by law enforcement agents in Russia or in neighboring countries, even though there have been plenty of reasons to apply it. So this process of the uh, translation or domestication of international criminal law is necessary. You may ask why does it have to be done? Uh, Russia has um, general provisions criminalizing other crimes which may be used for genocide or war crimes. But there's a whole um, number of reasons in favor of domestication of international criminal uh, law, like uh, Russia's reputation uh, or um, too many legal loopholes. And the final thing is that we should go back to the center of the international criminal law development from the outskirts where we are now. I'd like to kind of try to get rid uh, and avoid the discussion among panelists and give the floor and give the audience a chance to ask questions and to make a couple of comments if you feel you have to do that. We have two volunteers with microphones and if you want to ask questions please make yourself known and don't forget to introduce yourselves. Thank you. I am Director of Legal Assistance Center. My name is Mikhail Yoffa. And I uh, have been defending Russian citizens in the European uh, Court for Human Rights. It's the case of guerrilla fighter Kononov and the cases of uh, the security agency veterans. I'd like to speak about a dangerous trend whereby international courts using universal jurisdiction that has been mentioned here prosecute former Russian citizens for international war crimes. Uh, even though the uh, guilt is not admitted. What is your question? And who are you asking? Uh, the, my question has to do with international jurisdiction, and I'd like to highlight the danger of applying international laws in a situation where there is uh, no guilt of a nation, of a country. I would like to ask this question of Gennady, who spoke about universal jurisdiction. Practice shows that national courts use uh, that in a different way. What distinction should be made and what is the legal regulation in such a case? Does the country's guilt have to be proven if when you prosecute a person, an individual, who acted on behalf of that government, of that nation? Gennady? Thank you for your question. I can see now universal jurisdiction in Kononov's case. Uh, as for the country's guilt, uh, according to the international criminal law canons, it's not a requirement. You may speak about the political nature of many trials and that criticism is heard with respect to many national courts, but that is a subject for a big discussion. Thank you. Could you kindly introduce yourself? Alfia Kayomova, Deputy Dean of the Department of the International European Law, the University of Kazan. My article is regarding artic my question is regarding Article three five six. Why are you unhappy about it? Because it seems to clearly give a reference to the international agreements 
uh, involving the Russian Federation as a participant. So the resolution of the Supreme Court of 2003 uh, offers quite substantial clarification about it. So do you want to include all the military crimes into the military uh, code of the Russian Federation? Do you want to have a particular article for each of them? Well, no. You see, this is a very blanket norm. I mean, based on the practice of the constitutional uh, court, there is a suspicion of the non-constitutional nature of the norm, because in fact, the problem is not that this could exist by itself. It does not do differentiate duly the criminal liability for different categories of military crimes. Uh, there are completely different standards and norms split by the nature of uh, damage and uh, harm to the public and the type of activities, specific types of military uh, crimes with an open reference at the end can be easily recorded by the criminal legislation. It would not take longer than two pages of language of the criminal code. As to what you're asking about, we have far worse examples of the introduction into the criminal uh, legislation. Alexey Dronov, Deputy Director of the Legal Department of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. My question to the, is to the representative of the High School of Economics. You were talking about the very sad state of the Russian criminal legislation. Do you have a monograph? Have you compared the criminal law of the Russian Federation against that of the other states? or? Have you analyzed what's going on in other states that are not part of the Roman statute of the International Criminal Court? I mean, you are being so categorical. Why? And uh, they also take this opportunity to ask the um, esteemed member of the Constitutional Court to comment on the sad uh, and poor state of the Russian criminal and justice, because at some point of time I was a member of the delegation developing the Roman statute and I was part of the editorial committee and I extremely well remember how myself with the colleagues from other agencies revisited the newly adopted at that time criminal code and it did not look all that sophisticated and challenging. And in fact, the differentiation of the composition of crime and the crime and the type of liability, in fact, can be resolved in a far easier way. So, when you are talking about the very sad and poor state of the criminal justice in Russia, um, I somewhat disagree with you because I cannot see good reason for these statements. But I really do want to hear from uh, the representative of our constitutional court. Who would like to take this one? In fact, the list of my works is published on the website of the High School of Economics, and one of the latest articles is coming in the newsletter of uh, the Moscow University, uh, the series and the law. And in fact, I have many publications on this, and as to the constitutional uh, part of it, I'll redirect the question to Sergei. Well, it would not be proper for me to comment on the address of my colleague. It's just that whenever we give an assessment to the active uh, legislation, be it the criminal, the administrative one, or any other one, we should always remember that, in effect, law legislation uh, became something really active about 20 years ago, if you just remember what the state of the legislation was at that time before a law really came into practice and became a pragmatic thing and actually applied um, a type of uh, knowledge uh, you know what uh, state it was in so i believe it's uh, just a misperception also i would not want to refer to the constitutional court of the russian federation and to the european court in human rights as the courts that believe it is unacceptable to use blanket norms, indefinite norms, not exactly clear norms. Uh, the European Court of Human Rights has, and the Constitutional Court have many times um, reiterated that 
there cannot be such a thing as absolute and full clarity because there are things that are impossible to formula formalize fully and uh, things that cannot be fully characterized once and for all as demonstrating certain parameters and the courts have to do their job so if they are able to provide a proper explanation an explanation that would remove this lack of clarity and uh, the indefiniteness of things i think um, in this case there is no threat coming from the exclusive blanket norms the active norms that colleagues have been so critical about, perhaps oh, maybe a way too harsh on them, uh, relate to the following. The Criminal Code of the Russian Federation came into force in 2007, however, it was passed in the summer of 2006, and that was the time when the Roman Statute of the International Criminal Court was not available yet, and at the time when ad hoc tribunals were not common practice yet. Uh, nevertheless, the articles remained unchanged. That is, for 20 years, they uh, have not undergone any specific changes. So one of the answers uh, to the question of whether or not they are active uh, is in the statement that these norms are not applied. There are no cases, there are no successful investigations, and I believe this is something that encourages us to think at least about the fact that they are maybe somewhat imperfect. Colleagues Bartanian, Ushatsky and Janssen, how do you feel about this discussion on domestication? Well, I believe I should not get involved into this purely Russian uh, debate and things, um, but I would rather want to state the following. I think the biggest issue related to this chapter is not exactly the absence of the legal clarity. It's rather the absence of practice. We do not know what uh, issues are available in practice, what issues we have to deal with in practice. I mean, in order to understand how we tackle these issues, we ought to understand what they are. I mean, we first create an issue and then we heroically seek to tackle it. That's one of the approaches we use at times. But you see, if there is no such thing as enforcement, uh, it's hard to talk about the efficacy or inefficacy of certain norms and their application, enforcement, and uh, legal definiteness or indefiniteness. The European Court on Human Rights, in fact, in principle, does not provide for the need of regulating all the details, the legal in definiteness is not about non-detailization of the norms. A norm may be not detailized, but uh, still quite clear, although I do agree that the norms that would list all the crimes committed, in fact, would be a challenge. In fact, in Armenia, we have a number of uh, sub laws which list the types of military crimes, and um, a sanction uh, is at used at the end of each of them, uh, stating the number of years for sentence. But practice, as I said before, indeed may uh, bring about some specific challenges. Any there anything you would like to wish all of us? Oh, well, I only want to wish Russia and the Russian legal system and uh, the Russian lawyers some productive work in this area because I believe uh, having this amazing capacity, so many universities, so many uh, professors, teachers, uh, you can create the school of the international criminal law that is just so important for a state like Russia so that uh, this country can participate at the same level on the bar with others. You know, in the United States, in every university, they publish a magazine on the international criminal law. They do publications on each and every issue existing today, and they believe Russia is no worse, and they believe in Russia they can do the same. To say the least. I come from a dualist country, as I understand Russia is, and uh, 
we wholesale uh, domesticated the Rome Treaty and actually in one act got everything. But of course that could present a problem if you don't want to join the ICC. Thank you. Так, теперь я бы хотел дать возможность паре реплик, комментариев. Просьба об одной из них уже поступила от Павла Александровича. I would like to now invite a couple of comments. Uh, Mr. Laptev recently was uh, the commissioner under the European Court on Human Rights. Colleagues, it is a great pleasure uh, to have been present here to have attended uh, this session, the presentations of our first four speakers, I thought were very much correlated with the practice we have in the Russian Federation, except for Sergei has analyzed our mistakes, and I believe in the last case, the third case considered, I think there is some lack of uh, understanding. It's not about that the European Court bans uh, the test acquisition of drugs. It's about the ban on any provocative uh, activities coming from the law enforcement agencies. Myself and my colleague Fyodorov have written a relevant uh, article on this. In fact, for a long time I worked at the Russian Academy of uh, Justice and many of the judges of um, the general jurisdiction courts have had uh, similar questions to ask. And in fact, here I want not to correct what Sergei said, but to rather comment on his input. And in fact, I did like uh, tremendously his contribution in terms of the philosophy and the approach to the Constitutional Court, although the last two presentations I would comment on in the following way. Our great compatriot Nikolai Polyansky would have been devastated, uh, really, because the fact that you propose to leave an open, open list of acts in the criminal code, I believe this is something beyond any imagination. And that's the High School of Economics, and uh, that's a different school of law. It's not the Moscow School, not the Sverdlovsk School, not the St. Petersburg School. It's another, some different school of law. Um, I've been to the High School of Economics, you know, there good guys studying there, they do not propose uh, ideas like this, and I'm very saddened by the contribution from two uh, final speakers. Well, in fact, I wouldn't be so harsh, because indeed, at least the uh, contribution is stimulating and thought-provoking, and I believe that's exactly why we gather here, because uh, it's about the Martin's readings, which are research and science-focused, and also it's an international legal forum uh, having an authority of its own. Last comments here. Mine is more of a question, though. Aksana Sinatrava, I'm Deputy Dean of the Department of International Law of, of the University uh, named after Yaroslav uh, the Wise, uh, the Ukraine. My question is to all of you here, all of you are experts in the international criminal uh, law, I understand. So I would like to uh, draw your attention to the following and to express an interest in the following. Have you seen a difference in the way Article 1 of the Roman Statute is translated in English and in Russian and English. It reads as follows. The court should be complementary to national criminal jurisdictions, whereas in the Russian uh, language version, which is authentic, uh, it says the court complements the national domestic systems of criminal justice. These are two completely different systems, justice and jurisdiction. And this issue, in fact, was the foundation for the Constitutional Court in the Ukraine in 2001, making the decision whereby the understanding of jurisdiction was replaced by 
just as the jurisdiction is the, the authority of the um, judicial authority. Now, the international court is a subsidiary, it's complementary, like the uh, international court. It does not become the fourth instance. It starts operating as the European court at the time when the national jurisdiction cannot cope with defending the rights of an individual. It gets engaged when the domestic authorities cannot or uh, do not want to um, impose legal liability on the person. So, so far, there is no such thing as revisiting the case due to newly emerged consequent uh, circumstances. So, of course, the resolution has to be enacted. That's my first question. Also, the correlation between the international criminal law and the international humanitarian law in terms of legal regulating of intermediated conflicts, a proxy war, for instance, the criminal liability should we be talking about? It's the Gnellisichev case. But how do you go about the legal status, about the regulating of the humanitarian law? Because, in fact, for instance, it's a matter of the military captives. Uh, for instance, if one is held captive by the governmental troops, that's the military captivity. Now, if one is held captive by the anti-governmental uh, armed military groups, it's different. So the conflict gets absorbed or it gets internationalized. I mean, with the international criminal liability, things seem to be quite clear, but not in terms of the status. They can take your first question. In fact, it's a huge issue, even in the official translations, the French and the English one, which we deal with. You see, we have a different, uh, diff two different types of understanding and interpretation. Let alone other languages. You see, the quality of the translation is very poor in the first place at times. And uh, secondly, when you have the translation done by people who are not real experts in international criminal law, and it's not a matter of the grammar or syntax, it's also a matter of something beyond it. I would disagree with my colleague from Armenia Um, it's not about the dissolution of the borders between the legal systems. They do not exist in isolation. Um, I mean, there are institutions that are not available in the Roman and Germanic uh, system of law. I mean, the international criminal law is based on disclosure, disclosure which is a very important process. And in the Russian language, you cannot formulate it in just one uh, term. I don't know how it works in Ukrainian and other languages. And that's exactly why I would like to call on everyone to encourage you guys to establish the schools of international law in our respective states so we can introduce the identical interpretation. Because what you are talking about is Article 1 and no one has even thought about it. Thank you. Yes. Um, I would like to know Vladimir Vardinian's opinion, but Mr. Loptev, who asked his question and believes that he performed his duty, we had passionate uh, discussion and disagreement over the translation of the Human Rights Convention. You remember we were discussing different uh, translation options. No, we are not doing it now. We are not. Vladimir and uh, what kind of text will be ratified by Armenia? I'm not talking about the translation now, mind you. Are you ratifying uh, the uh, text of 78 uh, or a later version? Quite honestly, uh, y you know, ratification is not on the agenda. <laughs> What is on the agenda is to remove all possible obstacles preventing us from future ratification. Uh, I believe we'll uh, be ratifying this document the way it was drafted. 
you know that I raised this question during our telephone conversation. I was expecting an answer in this discussion. Well, I, I think that Armenia will ratify the document uh, in the way it signed it in 99. Well, as long as we discuss difficulties of translation, all post-Soviet countries face the same translation difficulties. Even when we do translation from Russian into the national language, um, because, uh, if you, you know, we, we deal with the, very often we deal with the Russian version of UN documents as for issues related to Article 1. Uh, yes, we pointed it out uh, when the Constitutional uh, Court uh, discussed this issue, reviewed this issue, and I'm from the Office of the Constitutional Court, but most of the documents were translated from Russian into Armenian. So we had similar problems, and by that time, we were familiar with the ruling issued by the Ukrainian Constitutional Court and the Constitutional Council of France. Those rulings, um, you know, became a kind of a psychological framework for our uh, decision. The Ukrainian ruling on complementarity, I always make a reference to that, to something that indirectly impacted on the ruling by the Armenian Constitutional Court. Thank you. Anita. I'm sorry for being impolite, and this is uh, how I'd like to conclude the conference. Some time ago, uh, based on uh, Ambassador Kolotkin's initiative, he is Russia's ambassador in the Netherlands, and he was supported by retired Justices Vereshetnikov and Skotnikov, Khodakov, ex-ambassador in the Netherlands, and Punjin from the International Court, and your humble servant. Uh, well, at that time, there was a proposal uh, to give uh, awards to for the best Russian research in the area of international criminal law, to give this award to a young lawyer, and that was supported by the Ministry of Justice, uh, Ivanian and Partners, law firm, and some other organizations. The Competition Expert Council was uh, created. The name of the competition is international law of the 21st century. In addition to those who first came up with the proposal, uh, managing partner from Ivanon and partners Christopher Emanon became a member of the council, director of the Institute of State and Law from the Utumian uh, University, Sergei Marichkin. Deputy um, uh, Chief Justice of the Eurasian Economic uh, Union Court, Tatiana Nishitaeva, uh, Nitu Shotska, Justice of the International uh, Criminal Court, and President of the Institute for International Law, Rain Mersan, and the President of the Russian Academy of International Law, Anatoly Pustin. The initiative uh, was designed to highlight the significance uh, and the importance of international law in the time uh, when short-term interest and idea of uh, expediency supported by force um, pretty often push countries to make decisions outside uh, the law field. Young lawyers from different Russian uh, regions responded, and the area, the range of subjects is very broad. The uh, debates among the council members were heated, and it was not easy to identify the winner. A lot of work, hard work, was done by um, a person from uh, Russia's uh, embassy in the Netherlands, Sofia Savikova, and Sergei Vizovsky from Ivanov and Partners on behalf of the initiators and members of the Award Council. I would like to declare our intention to have a competition in 2016, and we are expecting high level of work and uh, more response. I'd like to invite Deputy Herr Minister of Justice Helena Borisenko to come on stage, managing partner of Ivanian and partners Christopher Ivanian. Please come here. 
a senior counsel of the same law firm, Sergei Soskin, and was the laureate, the winner, the winner, Grigory Vaipan, please come here, his graduate uh, student of the Department of International Law. Uh, of Moscow State University Law School. The competition of 2015 finds uh, hereby declares the winner by uh, Mr. Vipon the concept of proportionality in contemporary international law, small evil for the great good. And uh, this prize uh, was issued by the Foundation of Legal Research and Legal Education and uh, the uh, people who came with the initial initi initiative also made donations and contributions to make this prize possible. Good afternoon, dear participants in the forum, dear participants in the round table. It was a great honor for us to participate in the uh, competition on international law in the 21st century because uh, <clears throat> the composition of the jury and let me reemphasize it once again, uh, it's the best. We have the best uh, international law experts, both Russian and international. So we are happy and proud to be part of that. We are happy that we have uh, young researchers, young scholars uh, who are inspired to develop international public law in Russia. My congratulations to you, Grigory. We are happy for you. My congratulations to the winner and my congratulations to the noble cause and to the laureate. Bakhtiyar uh, reminds me that we should probably to, to, to um, have more attention to the competition next year. Because, like I said, we are hoping uh, to have the same competition next year. Let me tell you that uh, we have this competition not just for the sake of giving a pretty certificate on the stage of the legal forum, but we provide financial support for the participants and will uh, try to increase uh, our financial support this year. It was about 5,000 euros. And in the future, we'll be attracting more donors uh, so that young Russian researchers could spend their time on research uh, rather than uh, job seeking or practical application of their skills. Uh, good afternoon. Something to add, two things to add uh, to what has been said. First of all, let me speak about why it is significant to do international law research. It may sound banal, but about 50 years ago, a famous uh, British researcher, Martin White, an expert in international relations, said that theory of international relations, unlike a domestic political theory, is a theory of survival. A domestic political life is an everyday routine. While international law is all about survival, a lot has changed in international law, but a lot has remained the same. International law is much more dramatic than domestic law, than national law, because it inclu includes uh, criminal liability for international law, uh, territorial conflicts, mass destruction weapons. All of those issues uh, are tackled in the realm of international law much more directly because they're directly related to the issue of good and evil, fairness and unfairness. That's why international law is so interesting. That is what makes it so interesting because as you research international law, uh, you're uh, expanding your understanding of law in general because law is about good and evil, fairness and unfairness. And another thing, the other thing I'd like to speak, it has to do with why the competition is so important. 
uh, I, uh, you, you know, as, as, as a young uh, Russian researcher, I didn't have words to tell you how happy I am that we have this competition. I'd like to express heartfelt gratitude to the creators, founders, organizers of this competition, to the members of the jury. And, uh, well, I, 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 I hope that uh, this competition will be a real milestone in the Russian legal life, a real thing. And to win the competition will be a daydream of every young expert in international law, like it's a dream for me. Thank you. Let me invite uh, everyone to small reception, small informal reception, uh, award presentation reception. So if you have time, uh, please join us. Reception is a domesticated uh, term for buffet.